So Othello is our, the last uh, tragedy we're going to look at, the last play on this course. Uh, it has its own idiom, and it has in the character of Iago, uh, arguably Shakespeare's blackest villain. A uh, terrible man. Um, he ha ha is almost uh, demonic. And uh, we can see that even in one of his first lines. He says that I am not what I am, which is an echo of God's own revelation of who he is. When Moses asks God, asks God who he is, he says, I am that I am, or, or I shall be what I shall be, which isn't an answer. You know, who are you? He doesn't give him an answer. Or, but if, if you take I shall be what I shall be, we'll just watch what I do, and then you'll know who I am. And this is in some ways a reflection on, on God's nature. God is, uh, the word devar in Hebrew suggests both word and action. God is the God who acts. He, he acts decisively and reveals himself in action as well as in his words. But Iago, who is a very black character, as I say, declares, I am not what I am. Well, what is he then? What exactly is this? He's a nihilistic character, destructive, uh, hateful. Uh, the play has historically been taken as a play about racism. It's not. It's not about that. I think it's been colored by the transatlantic slave trade, which occurred after this. Um, it's not that um, Othello is not North African, but North Africans are not black. <laughs> They're not. If, if you've seen Libya and uh, Tunis and so this is not black. It's North Africa. He's a Moor. That doesn't mean that he's a black African. So it's not about race. It's more about religion. This is a former Muslim convert into Christianity. That's what the play's about. Yes. I was just about to add that in, in, um, in Arabic, his name is translated into Athalla, which is like a very Middle Eastern name. Right. Yeah. So. Iago's is. Or Othello, sorry. Othello. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but that's the reception of it, and to this day it's portrayed that way in English-speaking theaters for cultural reasons and obvious reasons to some degree, but it's not, the play is not about racism. Sorry, I don't know if I'm sorry or not sorry, it just, it really is not. Um, but it is about bigotry and hatred, and race it would, might be a f uh, one ins way of instigating hatred or a means for being uh, feeling hateful feelings, but it doesn't seem to my mind to be in Shakespeare's mind at all. And why Iago hates Othello so much doesn't even seem to be the fact that he's uh, an ex-Muslim. That doesn't seem to be it either. It's, it, it's not that rational. And this is what makes Iago such a terrible character. He doesn't really seem to have a good reason for doing things. He just hates the Moor. That he says it, I hate the Moor. Why? It seems to be simply that he is the third in command and he's overlooked by Othello. He prefers Michael Cassio. That's about it. He thought he deserved to be preferred. And there was no reason for doing that anyway. Cassio was his first lieutenant and Cassio the second, or uh, Iago the second. And so it was entirely right that Othello would prefer Cassio, but Othello or Iago seems to think he deserved more. It's very satanic. A sense of injured merit, military rank. This is what it, it's realistic insofar as military men are very much driven by honor. And Othello is the prime example of it. We have to understand in, in reading this and understanding Othello, we cannot understand him outside of seeing a very noble military man. Honor is all to Othello. In some ways, then, the uh, most admirable of all the heroes in Shakespeare's plays, it, of the tragedies we've just looked at. We don't have one in King Lear. We didn't have one in Macbeth. We didn't have one in Hamlet quite like this. Here we have a, a figure, a man of action. And also, here's the, Othello is the Renaissance man. He's a, a Muslim convert. Uh, who loves his people and uh, is, seems to be motivated by the good and acts accordingly. So he's a very idealistic character. Not only is he idealistic 
uh, in his character, he's in his action. He's a very, very, very good character. More so than any of the other characters we've looked at. And you have to see that, and it's hard to see. And if you see him as a black guy who's, you know, who's just experiencing racism, you, just, you miss the whole point of the play. I just, I don't. So it's not just a small point, it's a big point. This is a, a man of honor uh, who, who lives by that. So he is the ideal Renaissance man. Whereas Iago, if we're talking about the dramaturge figures, which we've had throughout the plays in some ways, like it's one of Shakespeare's favorite devices is to have these figures who are trying to manipulate and orchestrate things. And, uh, but Iago is the antithesis of the dramaturge figure. He's an anti-dramaturge figure, if you will. It's almost sat satanic, evil be thou my good. He wants the evil thing to be done. And he twists everyone and seems to delight in doing it for no reason other than to do wickedness. Now, remember, we looked at the views of the imagination in the first play, Midsummer Night's Dream. And we saw the possibilities where the imagination could go wrong. We saw it in the forest, right? We began in Athens where we had uh, reason which had gone wrong. The, the law of Athens, Athens was a place where a, a father was willing to have his daughter executed for not marrying the man he wanted her to marry. It's not just that he was going to say she was illegitimate, he was going to execute her. And that was the law of Athens. It wasn't just a, a, a spiteful man. The law of Athens al allowed that. Uh, the duke uh, who are, are in, in power there, rather than that happened, allowed for an out. You can go into exile. That was not mentioned as a legal possibility, but he gives her that. So you can go into exile. They choose in the interim to elope. They go off into the forest. But in the forest, it's not only reasoning that's defective, so is the imagination. In the forest, the, everything goes wrong. So reason is wrong. The imagination is wrong. And then towards the end of the play, now we have the right relation of reasoning and imagination, and then it ends up well through the, through the vehicle of the plays and so forth, right? So you get this uh, sense. And the imagination, of course, can lead you to bad thoughts, irrational thoughts. In the forest, that's, it's full of irrational thoughts and irrational happenings, you know, um, bottom having the head of an ass and all that stuff. So pe people are not thinking clearly. Shakespeare is not to accept that. That's not what the good imagination does. That's a perverse sort of imagination. That's what Iago represents, a irrational hatred, which does lie behind racism and does lie behind anti-religious bigotry. You hate the other person just because. You see it in the playground. Kids don't like one another. They look different. They say something a little off, they, but they're a little different. That's enough. It's just this irrational, it's the wickedness of the human heart, and he represents it really well. Now, but he, what he does, which most of us don't do, is he acts upon it, and he uses his imagination to create an alternate world as well, but this is not the world on which to reconcile and bring good things about. It's the exact opposite. He wants to create a lower, more base world, a more wicked world, than, one, than the one in which he lives. So he takes the reality as he experiences it and writes it in opposite terms. So he is truly black in his spirit. Othello, as I say, I'm not sure he's black in his appearance. There's some reference to his skin color, but you know, if you look at the Arab world, they're not particularly black. I mean, it's, it's, I mean it's the Mediterranean calling, more or less. I mean, it's just not there. And I don't think Shakespeare thinks otherwise. It's just, it's not evident to me. But there is a lot of play on blackness. And that's one of the reasons the critics think it's about racism. We keep talking, using this word black. Yeah, but Shakespeare means it more in a moral sense, in the Christian sense of the, the biblical terminology of black and white, right? Sins are black and Righteousness is white, and it's not about skin color. It's just not of interest at all. Um, 
and neither is slavery in the Bible for that matter. It's not a, it's not a matter of, uh, of race. It's a matter of being, you're captured by your enemy that you get thrown into slavery. In Shakespeare's day, most of this, by the way, the, the Christian world by this time has abolished slavery. It's gone. There's no slavery in the Christian world, whereas it's in Islam in the day and remains to this day, but most of the slaves that are there are sent to them by the Vikings. So they're white. They're white. So the Vikings go around and they're capturing North Europeans and they're sending them down to be slaves in the Muslim empire. So it's not just the black. A, you can be white and a slave, believe it or not. <laughs> it's, the history is very clear on that. And it, and it has been the case and it is now increasingly becoming so again. So it's not, a, it's not related to a racial thing. It's you are vulnerable, you've been captured, I'm gonna send you down. And that is, so the slavery issue might be there, but more it represents the wickedness of uh, the, the Islamic folks that, um, that Othello, the Christian prince, is trying to prevent from invading Europe. Remember, at the time this is written, this is not that long after, um, it, Muslim, uh, the Muslim world is, is moving up towards uh, Christian Europe. It stops at the gates of Vienna, but not long before this. I mean, it's literally almost concurrent with it. It's a decade or so around, like it's around this time. So this is a real threat. And with that, it's not just a different religion, it's the imminent prospect of slavery. You're not only going to be uh, conquered, you are gonna be subjugated and enslaved. So it's a real threat uh, in Shakespeare's day. And uh, so much so, and this is the concern of the Pope when Luther begins his Reformation, is I have an enemy on my, uh, my south and east that threatens to overcome all of Christendom. And you want to have a theological dispute? Yes? I was just going to say, I think it's kind of weird for Shakespeare to mention that Othello was not Italian, not a white man, and like racism not be not play any part of the play like if he was i think there's a reason that he was like a person of color and if racism didn't have any part in that then why why was that detail mentioned well it might have a little bit of detail but it doesn't have the same coloring that it does for us i don't think <laughs> wrong word coloring the, sa <laughs> the same sense of the word race it seems more his identity as, a, as an ex-Muslim, but there is some mention of his skin color for sure, but it just doesn't seem to be, it's not the motivating factor of the evil, and it's not something that, uh, I, I just don't think it's got the same emphasis there. But I, does it play some factor? I don't know. Uh, as you say, Italians, Northern Italians regard white, uh, Southern Italians as very dark and swarthy, and they are, like Northern Italians tend to be blonde-haired and blue-eyed, and Southern Italians dark-haired and dark-eyed and so forth, and darker-skinned even, right? There's a definite, and there are regional disparities there. So there, and there, there is a racist element to that, but, and that's in every culture. You get the same thing in India, you get in China, it's around the world, mm -hmm. basically. So maybe there is a bit of an element of that, but it seems more the, 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 the basic conflict in the play is between an Islamic world and the Christian world. That's really what the conflict in the play is about. It's not about the white versus the black. That's a non-issue. Mm -hmm. So they might express some form of racism, but that's not the chief animus in the play. The chief animus seems to be the religious conflict. Mm -hmm. And this is a former one of those guys, and now he's one of us, and, and he's defending Venice. I don't know. I mean, maybe I'm overstating it, but I don't think so. I think that's about right, roughly. Yes? It's also, I think, going to be seen in the life of the Crusades. Of course. And so, like, he would be referred to as a Saracen. Yes. Uh, in some capacity. Like well, he isn't that. in the play, and but... The Venetians were very, very, very involved in the Crusades against... The it was one of the chief ports for the Crusades. Right. Sure, launching points. As is Cyprus, which is mentioned. I mean, the scene is Venice, and it's a seaport. Uh, it's a seaport in Cyprus, actually. So there are two scenes there. And Saracen was like calling someone a Saracen was sure a little bit about the race, but more was about what their religion was. It is. Because it's a hundred percent. You would call people from Turkey a Saracen. You would call people from Egypt a Saracen. Is it just a blanket term? It's a blanket term, just like the blanket term in the Middle East for Christians were Franks. They 
spoke right. the French. Right. Even though obviously the English are there, Excellent. the Germans are there. Excellent. I love it when the French get blamed for stuff, right? Yeah. <laughs> Right. Even after the idea of, oh, we actually know what those countries in Europe are called, even, even when they actually knew what they were called. In, in England, uh, v uh, venereal disease is called the Dutch disease or the French disease. In, in Holland, it's called the English disease. In France, it's called the English disease. Okay, whatever. Is this racism or is it just like, you know, like, they're an immoral, disgusting people. It's like that, that sort of thing. I don't, I don't know. And as I say, they don't even have nation states then. It doesn't, the modern nation state doesn't exist. So there's a lot of, on our part, anachronistic interpretations of what's going on in the text that I just don't think Shakespeare thinks of. And I, I'm not, I don't have a problem with somebody saying racism is a part of it. I just don't think it's as much a part as it has historically been read. It's not about a black versus white type. That's marginal in the play. It really is about uh, a religious threat that carries with it even stronger consequences, spiritual and even personal. As I say, you're going to be enslaved. If you lose this fight, it's not just that you are going to uh, lose a war. Um, and Iago uh, is the, at least as black an enemy as his, as the external threat. So if you want the, the previous play, I said that Fortinbras was the external evil threatening to invade Denmark. Here we have the, the Muslim ships that are coming threatening to invade. That's the external threat, but the internal threat is the real threat. It's Iago. And far darker, Shakespeare portrays it. He, it's not even about a religious play. That's sort of the template there, but it's really about the experience of Othello who's brought down the the great Othello. But note that Othello is called the Moor of Venice. That's the subtitle. Interesting. It's, it suggests to me what I just said. It's, this, is a, this is more of a religious play than a racial play. So he calls him the Moor of Venice. He's not a Moor. He's the Christian of Venice. Yep. Yeah, well, in this day, religion and politics, there's a lot of intertwining uh, of it, for sure. But that, but that, but that in, in Spain, that's centuries before this. Right, but I'm saying it seems, to be, it seems to be, like you're saying, religion and politics, not race. Well, I, the, I, I think that's the, main, that's the main point, and that's the only point I'm trying to make, is that's the main canvas against which you need to see the play. But all the language of black and white pulls you into that. But I think it has more of a moral connotation than anything else. Anyway, but Iago's evil, unlike many in many plays, it's established right from the start. He doesn't start good and then make a twist. He, he is a little bit... So even Edmund, as black a villain as Edmund was, we, we sort of had an excuse for him. He's, his father speaks in front of him about you know, how he's a bastard, yeah, but his mother was a good sport, and ha, 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 and he's not legitimate, but I have a legitimate son, and a little bit of joking and so forth, in front of his son, not very kind, we're, we're a little bit unhappy with his father, we have a little bit of sympathy for Edmund, we have none for Iago, he begins a black villain from the outset, without any cause, so I'll just, I'll read a few lines here, but the setting is at night, and most of the important scenes in the play are, and that's also telling, In uh, the gospel narrative, John's gospel says that Jesus is the light, and the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. When Judas betrays Jesus, Jesus gives him a, the, says, the one who I give this morsel to will betray me. Who is it? Gives it to Judas, and then he tells him to go. Do what you're going to do. And John adds to that, he goes, and it was night. I think what's with the reference to the scene? Like it, it, there's not much in the gospel accounts. It doesn't tell you it's day, night. Occasionally when it mentions, it mentions it when it has a theological significance. It begins by talking about light and darkness and now Jesus is giving himself over to the darkness. 
He goes out in the night and the darkness for a time is about to overcome the light, but only for a time. Here, likewise, it, it seems to me Shakespeare is using the darkness as not just a stage setting, but as a moral setting. Rod Rodrigo and Iago, tush, never tell me. I take it much unkindly that thou, Iago, who hast had my purse, as if the strings were thine, shouldst know of this. This blood, but you'll not hear me. If ever I did dream of such a matter, abhor me. Thou toldst me thou didst hold him in thy hate. Despise me if I do not. Three great ones of the city in personal suit to make me his lieutenant, off capped to him, and by the faith of man, I know my price. I am worth no worse a place. But he, as loving his own pride and purposes, evades them with a bombast circumstance, horribly stuffed with epithets of war, and in conclusion, non-suits my mediators. For certes, says he, I have already chosen my officer. And what was he? Forsooth, a great ar arithmetician, one Michael Cassio, a Florentine, a fellow almost as damned in a fair wife, that never set a squadron in the field, nor the division of a battle, knows more than a spinster, unless the bookish theory wherein the the togged consuls, togged consuls can propose as masterly as he, mere prattle without practice is all his soldiership. But he, sir, had the election. And I, of whom his eyes had seen the proof at Rhodes, at Cyprus, and on other grounds, christened and heathen, must be belayed and calmed by debtor and creditor, this counter-caster, he in good time must his lieutenant be. And I, God bless the mark, his moorship's ancient. So he's incensed. Cassio has been preferred to him. What's Cassio? He's an intellectual. He's never fought a fight in his life. It's not right. How dare he? And I'm his ancient. His counselor. By heaven, I rather would have been his hangman. Why, there's no remedy. Tis the curse of service. Preferment goes by letter and affection, and not by old gradation, where each second stood heir to the first. There's the, his grievance. He jumped the queue, he says. It's not actually quite true. But I, it should have been me. I have the experience. I've been in the union longer, so I, so I get the post, right? That's what I mean. I've been here longer. I've done more service, I have a longer service tenure, I should get the post, I didn't get it. Now, sir, be judge yourself whether I in any just term am affined to love the moor. I would not follow him then. Oh, sir, content you. So that's Rodrigo's response. Okay, well then don't follow him at all, that's fine. That's the solution to the problem. Okay, then don't serve him. No, that's not a non-problem. There you go, you're upset. You feel like you've been dealt an injustice? Well, <laughs> I would not follow him then. Oh, sir, content you. I follow him to serve my turn upon him. We cannot all be masters, nor all masters cannot be truly followed. You shall mark many a duteous and knee-crooking knave that, doting on his own obsequious bondage, wears out his time much like his master's ass. For naught but provender, nothing but food, and when he's old, cashiered. Whip me, such honest knaves. Others there are who, trimmed in forms and visages of duty, keep yet their hearts attending on themselves, and throwing but shows of service on their lords, do well thrive by them, and when they have lined their coats, do themselves homage. These fellows have some soul. And such a one do I profess myself. He does himself homage, homage. So he's going to appear to be a servant while he's serving his own needs. These people have, have honor. So the pretense of duty, the pretense of service, but actually there's, they're looking after their own interests. So it's the antithesis to Christian service. 
these fellows have some soul, and I profess myself to be one of them. For, sir, it is as sure as you are Rodrigo. Were I the Moor, I would not be Iago. In following him, I follow but myself. Heaven is my judge, not I for love and duty, and seeming so for my peculiar end. For when my outward action doth demonstrate the native act and figure of my heart, in compliment extern, tis not long after that I will wear my heart upon my sleeve for Dawes to peck at. I am not what I am. He's going to dissemble. He's going to deceive. He's going to act studious. He will do the exact opposite. It's not only that he won't serve, he will only serve himself. So uh, Martin Luther in his commentary on the brief uh, letter of Romans uh, says that, uh, describes sin as being curved in upon ourselves. Iago is a self-regarding man. In say, Curvatus. Sin is a self-regarding, proud, he's a proud spirit. Acknowledges no authority, although he appeals to God. He said, heaven is my judge, not I for love and duty. I'll appeal to God. I'll, I act in God's sight. He does not do that even. That's just pretense. Rodrigo, what a full fortune does the thick lips owe if he can carry it thus? Now there's the racial reference. I have the thick lips. If he can carry it thus. Call up her father. Rouse him. Make after him. Poison his delight. Proclaim him in the streets. Incense her kinsmen. And though he in a fertile climate dwell, plague him with flies. Though that his joy be bo joy, yet throw such changes of vexation on it as it may yet lose some color. Here's her father's house. I'll call aloud. Do, and with like timorous accent and dire yell as when by night and negligence the fire is spied in populous cities. And then Rodrigo, what? Ho, Brabantio, Senior Brabantio, ho! Awake, what ho, Brabantio, thieves, thieves, look to your house, your daughter, and your bags, thieves, thieves. Now Brabantio comes in. Now Brabantio is a racist. He is actually motivated by it and speaks in those terms. He is actually, uh, seems to be, a, he, he, he's able to manipulate him this way. But not all the characters are. In fact, uh, very few of them are. But he's a very, uh, the deceptiveness or deceitfulness of Iago is based on the pretense of sincerity. It's hypocrisy. Sincerity is a, ver is a very hard, th so people who appear sincere are very hard to see through. He's being honest with him. He's, he's actually s suggesting that he's not content and here's what he's going to do. So this is a good man, like he's willing to confide in him that he has malicious thoughts. Rodrigo, oh, he's not even concealing that. This is a man who's being candid with me. So R Rodrigo gets duped in here. Now, Rodrigo loves Desdemona. And Iago gulls him, that is, manipulates him by saying that, that he will get rid of Rodrigo, or of Othello, and leave him next in line. So that's, what, that's the bait. If I get rid of Othello, your way to Desdemona is clear. Aha. So he finds what everyone's vice is, the, his little sin. He finds where is that, where is the chink in your armor? And he goes right to it. And he gets them to, to on his, as he baits them and he, he catches them. And yet, uh, Rodrigo is deceived here. Now, Iago is a very self-confident man, not unusual for a military man, once again. Um, probably represents the new man of the Renaissance, but he's an opportunist. Uh, takes advantage of advances in science and, and commerce. So he's very much of a, uh, an entrepreneurial type. There's probably some sympathy in Shakespeare's audience for this, but there's also some a antipathy. He doesn't recognize uh, privilege and honor and the order of things. He, see, people go in the military because you can distinguish yourself on the field of battle. It doesn't matter if you're a commoner or an aristocrat. If you are valiant, 
you can rise in the ranks. So it's the, it's the place where good men can rise. There aren't many venues in life where that is the case. Uh, on the contrary, it's usually the opposite. But in military, you can actually uh, uh, say valorous. So there's a certain type of ambitious man who, who loves honor that goes into it, and Iago is one of those sorts. And so there's some there. Now, when he uses terms, by the way, and this is characteristic of his wickedness, the almost the opposite is intended. So when he uses the word soul, he means complete materialism, just utterly debased materialism. So he inverts the meaning of terms. That's characteristic of Iago's use of language. It's a reflection of his perverse anti-dramaturgy. He is literally working about wickedness. Characteristic of Satan, did God say that? You take the words and you just twist it a little bit. It's a parody. And the, the, just the deviation from the truth is enough to corrupt, not being attentive to the words. So Iago here gets Rodrigo to what is he going to do? Is he going to, he's going to stir up the jealousy and the, and the tendency towards tyranny in Desdemona's father Brabantia, which we also saw back in uh, Midsummer Night's Dream. The father who seems insistent that his daughter is his effective slave. You will do what I tell you to do. And that's the end of it. So he's not a likable character. Brabantio, what is the reason of this terrible summons, line 82? What is the matter there? Senor, is all your family within, says Rodrigo? Are your doors locked, Iago? Brabantio, why? Wherefore ask you this? Zunes, by Christ's wounds. That's what zunes means. It's the, and it's a swear. He's swearing. Zoon, sir, you're robbed. For shame, put on your gown, your heart is burst. You've lost half your soul. Half your money. Last half your soul. Even now, now, very now, an old black ram is, topping, is tupping your white you. Racist language. He uses it here. There's a man who has making love to your daughter, the old black ram, tupping your white you. Arise, arise, awake. The, uh, this is, you know, it's filthy language. Awake the snorting citizens with the bell, or else the devil will make a grandsire of you. Arise, I say. What? Have you lost your wits? This is Brabantio. Rodrigo, most reverend senor, do you know my voice? Not I. What are you? My name is Rodrigo. The worser welcome, I have charged thee not to haunt about my doors. In honest plainness thou hast heard me say, my daughter is not for thee. And now, in madness, being full of supper and distempering drafts, upon malicious bravery dost thou come to start my quiet. Sir, 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 but thou must needs be sure, my spirits and my place have in their power to make this bitter to thee. So there's a previous relationship here. It's like, you're not marrying my daughter. You're not worthy of her. Get out. I'll make things this bad for you. Patience, good sir. What tells thou me of robbings? This is Venice. My house is not a grange. Most grave Brabantio, in simple and pure soul, I come to you. Now, Iago, note the language and the, lo the loss of meter here. Zoon, sir, you are one of those that will not serve God if the devil bid you. Because we come to do you service and think you think we are ruffians? You'll have your daughter covered with a Barbary horse? No, that he's not referring to his, uh, his skin color. Is an animal, a Barbary horse, a war horse. You'll have your nephews neigh to you? You'll have coursers for cousins and gennets for Germans? What profane wretch art thou? I am one, sir, that comes to tell you your daughter and the moor are now making the beast with two backs. Beast with two backs, yeah. Yeah, it's all vulgar. That's typical of, yeah, okay, sorry. Sorry, I've been seeing too many Shakespeare's play doing the hand gestures now so everyone sees what I mean. The beast with two backs. Thou art a villain! You are a senator! 
This thou shalt answer. I know thee, Rodrigo. Sir, I'll, I will answer anything, but I beseech you, if it be your pleasure and most wise consent, as partly I find it, is that your fair daughter, at this odd, even and dull watch of the night, transported with no worse, nor better guard, but with a knave of common hire, a gondolier, to the gross clasps of a lascivious moor. If this be known to you and your allowance, we then have done you bold and saucy wrongs. But if you know not this, my manners tell me we have your wrong rebuke. Do not believe that from the sense of all civility I thus would play and trifle with your reverence. Your daughter, if you had not given her leave, I say again, hath made a gross revolt, tying her beauty her duty, beauty, wit, and fortunes in an extravagant and wheeling stranger of here and everywhere. Straight satisfy yourself. If she be in her chamber or your house, let loose on me the justice of the state for thus deluding you. Strike on the tinder, ho! Give me a taper. Call up all my people. This accident is not unlike my dream. Belief of it oppresses me already. Light, I say, light. Iago, farewell for I must leave you. It seems not meet nor wholesome to my place to be productive as if, I, as if I stay, I shall, against the moor. I can't be seen to be conspiring against the moor. For I do know the state, however this may gall him with some check, cannot with safety cast him, for he's embarked with such loud reason to the Cyprus Wars, which even now stands in act, that for their souls, another of his fathom, they have none to lead their business. Everyone's dependent on Othello. In which regard, though I, do, though I do hate him as I do hell pains, yet for necessity of present life, I must show out a flag and sign of love, which is indeed but sign, that you shall surely find him lead to the Sagittary, the Ray search, and there I will be with him so for well. Now, Brabantio comes around and, it's, and he finds out that his daughter is in fact gone and is in fact with the Moor. And now he, all of the allegations of what has happened, he thinks are also true, which they are not. They have not even consummated the marriage. And he loves, Othello loves her, and likewise, and she pursued him furthermore. And why did she love him? Because he was black and big? And, no, because she loved his mind. Okay, so all these things are going to prick holes in the picture, but this is, this is slander. Slander is very effective, highly effective. And there's enough truth here, and that's the point. There's enough truth in the story to bait the hook. And then the older man's sense of how dare she, without my leave, is kindled. His sense of injustice. His daughter ought not to do such things without his consent. Those sorts of things. But those are the ways in which Othello does this. Now he goes, so there are two lies in one sense. If they're making love while it married, it would be fine, but they weren't consummating their marriage. One, they're not consummating anything yet. And secondly, they are married. So he perverts the truth and he goes to tell Othello this and he does. But then he claims Rodrigo said it all. So he's going to betray a Rodrigo. So he just goes around lying all the time, right from the outset. Wicked, wicked man. But anyway, we'll read the rest of the play and come to it next time.